says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. May God bless you, and I hope this is a great day for you with Christ. Welcome to Today with Christ. I'm Don Smith at the Radio Bible Hour with Scott Ingram, and we're glad that you've joined us today for the broadcast. Uh, You know, today we're going to do a little bit of an in-depth Bible Mm -hmm. study on a passage uh, from 2 Samuel chapter 7, if you'd like to get your Bibles out. And we'll be looking at a video from Dr. J. Harold Smith as he discusses the promise that God makes to David uh, in this passage. And then we're going to look at the implications of that in our own lives uh, and in the lives of everyone who wants to live successfully. Mm -hmm. It'll really show us how we should build our homes, not just here, but for eternity. So uh, how about we get started in that that video? Okay. And I trust that during these next few moments, we'll be a real blessing to your heart as we turn here in the Word of God, while that coffee is cooling for just a moment, to 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 27, where the Lord says, I will build thee an house. Now, you'll remember that the Lord was talking to David here, and he'd made to him a wonderful and a marvelous promise. He said to him, David, I'm going to build you a house. Have you ever stopped to think about it, that the house that the Lord builds is the only kind of house that becomes a home? There are so many of you that are trying to live in a house and not a home. There are so many of you that feel that God is not an essential part of your household. It doesn't make any difference this morning how fine the furniture or the fixtures, or how lovely the china, or how gorgeous the drapes and the carpets may be on your window and on your floor. It doesn't make any difference what your bank account may be, nor what your social or political standing may be in the community if you do not have the Lord in your house. It is not a home. And I do believe with all of my soul and with all of my heart that the house that is going to really stand is the house that the Lord builds. I wonder if the Lord has built your home. If the Lord is the head of your household, then there's a family altar. There's a place of prayer. There is a place of Bible study. There is a place of devotion. There is a place of love, one for another. And I do not believe that there will be that great generation gap that so many are talking about today if the Lord really builds your household. I know that if the Lord builds your house, there will never be a divorce. No, sir, it takes the devil to bring about a split between a husband and a wife. The Lord is not responsible for that. You'll remember that the Bible declares that God granted a bill of divorcement only because of the hardness of the hearts of the people and not because it was in His divine will. What sort of a house, what sort of a home do you have this morning? Now, the Bible declares that God will build your house. And so as we look here in the Word of God, we find that He wants to become the contractor. He wants to become the architect of your house. And when God becomes the contractor and the architect of your household, you will not find that the foundations will be eaten away by the termites. You will not find that one day it will be blown away by the tornadoes that will sweep across your life. It will not be shaken down by the earthquakes that are bound to come to all of us at some time in our lifetime. But is it wonderful to know that our God says that our house shall stand if it is built upon the rock of ages? Yes, the floods may come, and the winds may blow, and the rains may descend, and great may be that tremendous flood and storm that will break in upon you. But if your house is built upon the rock of ages, it will stand. Where is your house this morning? Is it on the rock of ages, or is it on the sand? If it is on the sand, the Bible declares that one day it will fall. When the wind blows, when the rains descend, and when the storm breaks, your house is going to fall. And the Bible says, great will be the fall thereof. But if it is upon the rock, the rock of ages, it'll stand forever. Well, neighbor, it's been good to be with you again on Coffee Break. 
And until our next telecast, may the Lord bless you. That was great hearing my dad discuss uh, that passage of scripture. Uh, this uh, particular tape was made in the late 1970s, mm. and it's really interesting to hear him uh, focus in on the relationship between God building David's house mm -hmm. and God building a home uh, oh, yeah. in a family or a marriage. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about that for a few minutes. Yeah. You know, just to set this up historically in this passage, David had noticed that uh, the Ark of the Covenant was housed in a tent. Mm -hmm. And David said, I have a home of cedar wood, which yeah. was a, a fine home. Mm -hmm. That was the mark of a fine home in those days, the use of cedar wood in that area. And he felt bad because the Ark of the Covenant was housed in just a tent mm -hmm. while he lived in a cedar house. And he had this desire to, as he said, to build a home for God, to build mm -hmm. a house for God, for the Ark. And uh, God said no. This was not what God wanted. And make a long story short, God said, uh, uh, I'll build you a house, yeah, David. Right. And right. so today we're going to focus on what that means to have God build our house. Yeah, definitely. And uh, God, uh, he, he left him with so many protections and plans. He said, uh, you'll not lack for someone to, to rule over the kingdom of Israel. He said, I'm going to protect you through all of these different uh, things. You know, do you ever think about what your legacy is going to be? Uh, how you're going to, to reach your family? I know some of you at home right now, you think, you know, my family is so far away from God. There's nothing that, that could possibly bring them back. But, but God says that if we'll, we'll lay ourselves in his hands, he can do mighty things. He can do miracles, can he, Don? He can. And I've seen over and over people who had uh, given up almost on mm -hmm. their children or on uh, uh, someone that was special in their lives, a spouse or whatever, oh, and yeah. yet they continued to be faithful to God and to live their lives for the Lord only to see what could only be described as a miraculous change, a oh, conversion yeah. uh, in those people that they were praying for. So God is uh, suggesting here that he's going to do something for David, and that scene generally is a promise to all believers. Mm -hmm. uh, God is saying not just to David, but to Don and Scott and to all of you that if you will serve me, I will build you a house. Yeah, yeah. And that's a beautiful, beautiful idea. I, I think about uh, in, in Deuteronomy 6, uh, it talks about how uh, how Moses was telling the people about how they should live their lives. And in Deuteronomy 6, it says, um, let's turn over there for just okay. a second. Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says there, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And this is how you're supposed to raise your families, he says. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and, and thy, they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. So God is saying that when you sit down and have that family altar uh, with your children, it's not just those last few minutes before you go to bed where you open up a Bible and you read a Bible verse. It's something that you do all the time. It's a, it's a lifestyle. You can tell a Christian home when you walk into it. There's a different atmosphere that is there because it's, not, it's something that's ingrained in the environment of the people living in that home. Mm -hmm. It truly is. Um, and I noticed, too, that uh, here uh, Dr. Smith is talking about uh, this idea that the foundation mm -hmm. of that home is really 
God, that yeah. if God is the is the foundation, the bedrock of that, you know, Jesus uh, talked about uh, those who would follow me will keep mm-hmm. my commandments. And yeah. uh, to do so, he said, is likened to the man who builds his house on rock yeah. as opposed to the man who builds his house on sand. And we'll come back and talk about that passage a little bit later in the broadcast today. But how many people today are really establishing their marriage? on Mm -hmm. this principle uh, or going into a business for that matter with Mm -hmm. someone else or going into some relationship uh, and they uh, look for many, many other uh, things in common, you know, Mm -hmm. but is there a common faith uh, in God that's the foundation for that relationship? I think about uh, very often uh, in premarital counseling situations, we'll sit down with people and we'll make sure that they have similar attitudes about money yeah. uh, and credit cards and how much we're going to save. Uh, do they have similar ideas about whether they want to have children? Uh, do they have similar ideas about how children should be raised? Mm-hmm. Uh, do they have similar ideas about how much of their life should be devoted to work and how much should be devoted to recreation? and home life? There are all of these things that come up. Mm -hmm. And yet very often they forget to ask the most important question. What is your faith in God? Mm -hmm. And do you share the same faith? Uh, And if they don't, there's going to be, uh, unfortunately, some building uh, on sand because any of those other things can change and come apart. Mm -hmm. But God doesn't change. He's the bedrock. Absolutely. And and once God is firmly in that home, it affects everyone within that home. It's what makes makes it a home Uh, as you're saying there there's such a such a in a marriage there's such a connection there it's a it's a union that is so complete Um, Mm -hmm. and it if if one is pulling one way I I, it reminds me of the the scripture that says about um, about being unequally yoked uh, you can be yoked uh, together, which a yoke, as we've talked about in other programs, is when it, uh, two animals are put together and they pull a wagon together. Now, if there's one of the animals who is alive, alive in Christ, he's moving along, he's doing the work. Mm-hmm. But then you've got this other uh, person or animal in that case, case uh, dead in their sins. Mm-hmm. They're not able to move towards what God wants. Mm-hmm. Actually, that one person is being drugged down into the ground mm-hmm. uh, because they are not connected uh, with God. They're alive, mm-hmm. and it's like they're pulling this dead animal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think of so many marriages today that are like that, where there's one person in the home fully committed to God, living for God, but then there's this other person who's not. Mm-hmm. And, and God says, you know, mm-hmm. don't don't have a divorce because of that. Don't don't let that keep you from uh, because you'll have, be able to influence your children in that way. But He tells us to uh, to stay with that person, prayerfully lifting them up, showing them God all this time. Mm-hmm. But my, wouldn't it be better, as you're saying, to look at these things before you go into that business deal, before mm-hmm. you step into that marriage, mm-hmm. and make certain that that Christ is the center. As you begin, you mentioned something, Scott. You talked about a family altar. Can you mm-hmm. describe maybe uh, people are watching who haven't grown up uh, in the faith and in, in Christ or in a Christian family, and that just goes right over their heads? What is that? Is that some sort of altar that you build in your house? And <laughs> no, it's and a, uh, it, when you think of altars, I guess in your home you think of these crazy megalomaniacs setting something up uh-huh, with candles, yeah. but that, that's not the case at all. Yeah, what we're talking about here is uh, a time that you set aside. You open up your Bible with your kids, with your family, and you sit down and just read the passage and explain it to one another. And this is something that that I started with my kids when they were very young. We started out with a a Bible storybook, and we would sit down and and read through that and and study that. There's some great things now uh, that, that you can use for a family altar. There is an app on the App Store on iTunes that you can download which is like a little cartoon that explains basic Bible stories. Mm -hmm. Uh, We are losing in our nation the ability to pass on the Word of God to the next generation. Mm -hmm. We really are. And and if we're not actively seeking a time to sit down with a family altar like that Mm -hmm. uh, and and sharing our faith with with the, the children, they'll not pick that up. Uh, without you showing them the Word of God. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But it's also not just something uh, that, that mm-hmm. you sit down in a formal atmosphere. Um, it's also something where you, you sit and you talk about these things, as we were talking about in Deuteronomy. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a time when you will, uh, like my dad, we were out working out in the field one day, and a rainstorm came upon us. And we had just gotten done with the work that we had to do that day. So we went, and we were walking back inside, and my dad looked at me, and he said, well, I guess the Lord kept the rain off of us until we were done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a simple phrase, right? Mm -hmm. What was taught in that simple phrase? Mm -hmm. First, there is a God. There is a God who cares about us in our little tasks that we're doing. This God controls the very weather, controls the very effects of time. Think of all that was brought out in that simple little phrase, which I'm sure he did not think about when he looked and told me those things so long ago. But this is what it means to pass on that faith, to let that foundation be built upon. Jesus Christ is the foundation, but friends, he wants us to build on that foundation. Mm -hmm. He wants us to build our children, our wives, our husbands up. So they will become more and more a follower of Jesus Christ. We want our children to understand that we are uh, dependent on God for all that we have and that when he blesses us, we're grateful. Uh, In that tradition in my family, we've always uh, begun a meal Mm -hmm. with a time of Thanksgiving. And and it's really easy for that to become just sort of a little empty ritual. Mm -hmm. And we all say the same words. But included in that is I always try to make it uh, something that I'm especially grateful for. Mm-hmm. Thank you that the kids are all here today. Or uh, you know how much we love uh, uh, these kind of potatoes. And uh, <laughs> we're just so grateful for yeah. uh, for the love that prepared these. And for you, our Father, which uh, uh, provided for us in this way. And we communicate uh, our appreciation, our gratitude for God in that way. Mm-hmm. So uh, here uh, in this uh, uh, message from my father today, we've seen that God is directing us to establish all of our relationships Absolutely. on a common love for Jesus Christ, to let him be the center of your relationship and let him be uh, the reason for the relationship. Absolutely. So that if my wife and I have uh, married in order to serve God, if we have married in order to look for ways to bring glory to Jesus Christ every day, if that's the reason for our marriage, we're going to be standing side by side, looking out, facing the world. And uh, the world kind of defines a good relationship as two people in love gazing into each other's (laughs) eyes. Uh, But that kind of love really doesn't get much done for the Lord. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we need to have couples who uh, are looking uh, out for ways to serve God who are facing uh, forward into the world with Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And, you know, that idea, uh, today we have people who get married because they want it to be about them, about, Mm -hmm. oh, I will finally see the love that I wanted. I will Mm -hmm. get all the things I wanted. But when both couple, both of the couples are looking towards Jesus, it's not Mm -hmm. about them anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not even even about the other person anymore. Mm -hmm. It's about doing what God wants. And, you know, this, this atmosphere doesn't show up just in a a marriage, just in a home, but it builds into the church itself, which we have a great picture sermon this morning that shows how the church is built up of families, of people that God has called Mm -hmm. to put in certain places. So I hope you'll enjoy this short video today. You know, I'm thankful that as I've traveled up and down America in practically every state of our union, and in some 33 foreign lands preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Everywhere I've ever gone, I've found some Christian men that really love the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe with all of my heart that there have never been a group of men nowhere in the world that love lost souls better than some of the Christian businessmen that I've met around the world. I have never met a Christian businessman in all of my life that was ashamed to entertain Jesus in his home. If he was not ashamed of him in his business, he was not ashamed of him when we got down to his house. And many of these fine Christian Christian businessmen are some of the greatest men that I've ever known in living in their home. Yes, I want to tell you, my friends, this crowd, that Jesus said, I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. A bold confession of Christ at the beginning of the right way is is the right way to start a Christian life. 
Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. When I stop to think about how, my dear friends, we too, for these many years have tried to reconcile you with the Lord Jesus, how that we have tried to tell you that he is not only the king of the Jew, but that he is the king of the Gentile, that he is the king of the universe, and that he is the mighty and the eternal and the everlasting Father. And we have tried desperately to tell you that. And many of you have listened. Many of you have hardened your heart and stiffened your neck. Many of you down through the years have said, I will not have this man to reign over me. I want to give just a little personal testimony. And that's just this. I never really lived till I met Jesus. I never really knew what happiness and joy was until I met Jesus. I never knew what it meant to be subject to a king until I met the Lord Jesus Christ. But oh, what a joy has been in my heart ever since I met the true Jewish Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful that our Lord always has somebody for every position? You know, one of the most amazing things, one of the most unusual things, serving as a pastor has been to see how God would send in this man or that man. If we needed an auditor, one would join our church. If we needed a bass singer, one would come into our church. If we needed a new teacher, God would send us somebody that really knew how to teach the Word of God. If we needed a new personal worker, God could send us a man or a woman that was able to do that. If we needed a new visitor, God could send us that. Isn't it wonderful, my dear friends, to know that our God is able to place in that proper position, in that proper place, all of those, every one of those that are willing to serve Him. Our Lord knows exactly the place, exactly the position where you can be used to the best advantage and to His greatest glory. Will you yield yourself to Him? God forbid that you should refuse to say, Here am I, send me. In that little video message, my dad was talking about some of the great Christian businessmen that he'd known in his life. And it doesn't matter whether you're in business or you're in medicine or you're in sales or however you're making your living. Uh, the point is that if Jesus Christ is at the center of all that you do, it's going to be fulfilling. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much job dissatisfaction today oh, yes. because people are uh, really uh, working for all sorts of reasons, but they're not basing what they're doing on the idea that they are servants uh, of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I heard one person say that if you ever uh, find a job that you enjoy, you'll never work another day in your life. And uh, if you really are following Christ and you're doing as he wants you to do, you'll not feel like it's work. Sometimes yeah. it'll it'll be hard. Now, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. It'll be hard. It'll be a struggle. There'll be trials that come up but there's always this underlying joy that you just can't you can't get over you know that he that the, the creator of the universe has a part absolutely in leading you to do something for him and the meaning of this verse that we started with that yeah, god is saying to david i'll build you a building mm -hmm. uh, he's really talking about something deeper than a physical building oh, yeah. and uh, over in first uh, corinthians 3 uh, verse 9 first corinthians 3 9 paul says for we are laborers together with god ye are god's husbandry ye are god's building Mm -hmm. And then later in that chapter, he uh, goes on to explain, verse 16, he says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? Ye are the temple of God, yeah. and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So when God is talking here, making this promise to David, I'll build you a building, what he's saying is, David, I'm going to reconstruct you. I'm going to build you. Oh, yeah. uh, and that's the promise that God gives to us when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. He comes in, the Holy Spirit inhabits our very bodies yeah. and begins to reconstruct us. Yeah. It rebuilds us into a fit dwelling place mm -hmm. for God. Yeah, and there's a lot of tearing down he has to do <laughs> in yeah. the midst of all that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, 
the construction that takes place. But as he builds us up, he's making us into a new creature. Sometimes that hurts, but he, mm-hmm. he is building us up like that. And I think there in First Corinthians uh, about some of the other things, Paul, during there, he, he looks at the people and he says, uh, to be followers of me. Now, when you first hear that, you think, my goodness, why would he, he tell them that? He's telling them the, the, the Spirit of the Lord and then say to follow me. But later on throughout 1 Corinthians, he says, follow me as I also follow Christ. Mm-hmm. There's a difference. You see, you see, every person within the church, if they are all looking to one another and they are all looking to Christ, we're all heading in the same direction, working together. And God's not only building you up, it's not all about you, it's about Him building the church, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. building the church into this huge uh, group that is working together to, to, to create His will within the world, to move mm-hmm. out and, and to change things. And also see people uh, living their lives trying to do good, trying to be good people, mm-hmm. doing good work, being good humanitarians and mm-hmm. so forth, trying to yeah. be nice to other people. Uh, and if I ask them, well, you know, what is the basis for that? And they say, well, you know, I want the Lord to, I, I want to go to heaven. And, and so oh, I'm my. trying to, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, be yeah. good enough to be mm-hmm. acceptable to God. Oof. And yet that too is a, is a false path that we, we have to come to understand that we can never be righteous enough no. that the companionship and relationship with God is a free gift from him Absolutely. of his grace and not something we can ever earn. I had a fellow once look at me and he said, well, you know, and this man was near death and he looked at me and he said, well, you know, I, I hope he lets me in. Mm. And I thought, no, mm-hmm. that's if you have received this gift, you're getting in because and I, I fear he was thinking to himself, well, it's based on my good what I've done, but it's not. It's mm-hmm. based on what he done. Big difference there. Big mm-hmm. difference. Well, we just want to encourage you to examine your life today. What are the things that are motivating you today? Mm-hmm. Is it money? Is it the desire to be a good person? Uh, is it uh, uh, the righteousness of others? Are your parents encouraging you to be righteous? And mm-hmm. therefore, if you think you can please your parents, that's going to be good enough. Or maybe you're depending on just being involved in the right church. And if you're a mm-hmm. member of the right church and you go in every uh, morning for a service, that somehow that fulfills the requirement. But God is asking us for something much deeper. Oh, yes. He's asking us for a relationship in which we welcome him into our lives as the Lord of our lives, the master of our lives. And we invite him to rebuild us from the ground up, Amen. to build us a new building. Amen. I agree. And that's something that um, that you can do right now as you're watching this screen. You can bow your head, close your eyes. And, and I'm not going to tell you what to pray. You know what, what's in your life, the sin that, that, that's occurring within your life. You can bow your head right now and ask God to forgive you of that sin and say, God, I want to start anew with you. And you can do that today. And if you'll do that, this will be a wonderful Today with Christ. Amen. God bless you and thank you for watching. Tune in again soon for another broadcast. And uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you again. This is Don Smith at the Radio Bible Hour. We're glad you're watching Today with Christ. I want to tell you about our monthly publication, The Good Neighbor. It's a great little magazine. We've been publishing it here at the Radio Bible Hour uh, since 1940s. And so it's just a part of who we are. It contains articles and sermons by Dr. J. Harold Smith, other more contemporary issues on Christian living, and some of the uh, difficulties that Christians face today in walking with Christ. I think you'll like this magazine a lot. Uh, We publish it 12 times a year, and our subscription price is only $10 a year. If you'd like to receive it, write us, send your subscription to the Radio Bible Hour, and thank you for watching.